You know, last week we picked up back in Matthew following those four lessons on voting responsibilities. And we rejoined Jesus as he's in the temple there, uh, really in a verbal battle with the chief priests and the elders of the temple. He knows that he's about to die on the cross. He knows that these are his last chances to educate and minister and prepare his disciples for the job that they have after he has rejoined his father. And last, night, last week we looked at the parable of the tenants of the vineyard. And I just wanted to remind you that it made a couple of main points. First being that God re will punish those who refuse to submit to him. And secondly, that God can take away those things that he gives. In this case, the vineyard from the tenants. And there was a little noticed point in that parable, and that was the fact that Jesus was foretelling everyone that he is about to die as a man. So tonight we're going to pick up exactly where we left off last week. It's the next parable that Jesus is using to rebuke the priests and the elders and to educate his disciples. And it's about a wedding feast. So as I was putting this lesson together, I started thinking, think about your wedding back in the day. And then I want you to mentally compare and contrast it to the weddings of your children, if you have one, or grandchildren, or a friend's children or grandchildren today. And in your own words, tell me about the difference. How about you, Georgia? <laughs> uh, 30, 40, 50 times bigger. I mean, my, I mar Denny and I married at my parents' home. Simple gathering with probably 30 or 40 people. Simple food. Oh, there was a wedding cake and, you know, a minister and that kind of thing. But now... They spend so much money, and you have to rent a big facility, and it's just, and you just, I guess parents' prayer is that, <clears throat> that their mind is in the right place, that it's not about the wedding, it's about the marriage. Yeah, we but can only hope. We can only hope. And Georgia kind of summed up exactly the way I feel. The weddings nowadays are bigger, they're a lot more expensive, they're complicated, it takes three or four or five months to get everything together, oh, to pick oh, out the right dress, find the right yeah. church, and do all of this other stuff. And it becomes one of those seminal events in your life. Yes. And uh, young people, I think, well, you know, our, our friends had a big wedding, so and had a party, so we have to do the same thing. Yeah. So there again, it's about just having a big party. Keeping up. Keeping up, I guess. So would you say that this is a change for the better or for the worse? Worse. Worse. Absolutely. But did you know that it's not the first time this has happened? And that's what I want to do tonight, is start off with a little context before we talk about this parable. History is actually repeating itself with respect to weddings. Back when Jesus was still walking on the earth, weddings were the thing, the event. And this is how they happened. First of all, two families would get together and they would pledge their daughter and their son in order to connect those families. And in point of fact, in many cases, the bride and the groom really hadn't met up to this point. 
and they signed a contract. And depending on the social status of the groom, the bride's family would come up with a dowry. We're going to give you this because we're marrying our daughter to your son. And you'll recall that women were back in those days more like chattel than they were people. And when the family signed this contract, they were officially married. First time they've seen each other and all of a sudden they're married. But they didn't live together at that point. The bride went back with her family and the groom went off to build a home for them. And he stayed there until it was finished. And it could take some time, weeks, maybe months, depending upon the groom's circumstances. And then he would come back to collect his bride. And frequently, the bride's family didn't know he was coming, nor did his family. He just showed up. There's another parable that we may or may not get to down the road about the bridegroom and the ten virgins, you'll recall, and the fact that they weren't prepared for the bridegroom to show up. That's an offshoot of what I was just talking about. But when he showed up to tell everybody that their home was ready, then there was this wedding feast, this big banquet. And it was the big deal of the year or the age or whatever. It was a really big deal. And in the Jewish culture, it was a joyous event. It could last for a week. Always lasted more than a day. It was an extravagant and expensive event writ large for those Jewish families. And if friends and family members didn't show up, it was an insult. And that insult could fracture relationships from then on. So to me, when I was reading about that, it sounded kind of familiar when I started thinking about my daughter's weddings, my son's wedding, the fact that you go to all that work to put it together and spend all that money. It's not something that is new historically. So with that as background now, let's turn to our core text. Evans, would you read the first item on the handout? Matthew 22, 1 to 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. But they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind his hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. For many were called, but few were chosen. So let's talk about that for a minute. Now you'll recall that parables are real life events, but the characters and the places and the events in themselves represent something else. They are, they are 
directed towards the kingdom of heaven, towards God's kingdom. And so in this parable, what's your first thought with respect to what Jesus is saying here? How about it, Jane? He wants everybody to be there. He has chosen those who invite him into their hearts. But there were a lot of people at that wedding that hadn't. They were just there because somebody said, come on, come on. Who is he? Jesus. Jesus. So let's deconstruct the parable a little bit. Who is the king? God. God. As in all God, like God the Father and the Son. And God the Father, the Lord. Who is the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus. Who are the guests? The church. Everybody. Everybody. So Jesus is really comparing the wedding feast to heaven, the place you want to be. And he's telling the priests and the Pharisees and the elders, you know, everyone's invited to this feast, but when the time came and the table is set, those invited refused to attend. They gave excuses. I've got to go to the store. I've got to do whatever. And in fact, the king's servants who took the invitations out to the guests were mistreated, even killed. And that's a reference to the prophets, if you will, the saints. So the king is angry. And he punished those people who had killed his servants. And then, because the wedding hall is still empty, or nearly empty, he sends his servants back out on the road and says, invite everybody who comes along. And then this becomes an invitation, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles to the rest of the world, the point that Kenny was making a minute ago. But there's still a problem. The king finds a man who's not wearing the wedding clothes. And he's friendly with him. He says, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man is speechless. He doesn't have an answer or he doesn't want to give an answer, whatever the case may be. <coughs> so surprisingly enough, the king has him bound hand and foot and thrown out into the darkness with the implication that the guest who was rude and didn't wear proper clothing is killed. So when we think about it, the basic point of this parable is that the son who is being honored at the banquet is Jesus Christ, who is rejected by his own people, those who were first invited to the wedding. And if you look at your handout, John tells us in the third and in, in in John 1 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. And that's the tie between this parable and what is actually occurring there on the ground. Israel, as we said earlier, is who is first invited to this wedding feast. Jesus has been proclaiming all along that he is the Messiah. No one has believed him because they expect the Messiah 
to be someone who is going to come in and they're going to, he's going to throw out the Romans and take over Israel and return it to its position of glory under, as it was under King David and King Solomon. And he's going to be the almighty king. And Jesus has not done that. As a matter of fact, as Lloyd's been, Lloyd's been telling us all along, Jesus comes and is hostile to, and that hostility is reciprocated by the religious leaders of the day. And he's been telling them all along, you have corrupted the law. You've turned it into your own instrument. And it no longer belongs to God. That entry on your handout, number four, I think, Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the message that Jesus is now reinforcing, even though John the Baptist is dead. This is the kingdom of heaven. It's yours to achieve. All you have to do is believe. And just as the king killed those people, or just as the king's servants had been murdered, so too had John the Baptist and many of the prophets who had been speaking for the king. Carol, would you read... uh, Luke 21, 5 and 6, I think, yeah. Yes. Luke 21, 5 and 6. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come that when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. <coughs> So just as the law has been corrupted, the temple, the place where these religious leaders congregate and have corrupted the operation of, that temple too is going to be torn down. This is not something that has not been predicted. The king's Vengeance speaks of the desolation that was prophesied by Obadiah. And Obadiah tells us that God is patient, but he's not going to tolerate wickedness forever. Kenny, would you read number 6 there, Obadiah 1.15? For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Your deeds shall return on your own head. I want you to remember that because we're building up to a point here. Don't worry about it. Okay. (laughs) And that point is that those people who reject God's offer, His offer of salvation, are going to be punished. And we find it in many places in the Bible, but Hebrews 10, 29-31 is very explicit. Marcia, would you read those, please? Yes, Hebrews 10, 29 and 31. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified, he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So tell me, what do you think that verse means, or those verses mean? How about you, Karen Ludicky? You're laughing over there. I was thinking about falling into the hands of the living God when he was angry with you. No, thank you. No, thank you. I got, I got carried away with that, so I wasn't thinking about the rest of it. 
I do think that it says that God and the Spirit and the Son of God will indeed repay those sins. Um, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, is what I always heard. Um, so don't worry. I've also heard don't worry about those who, who are against you because the Lord will take care of that. Could be a fate worse than death, right? <laughs> but you know, there's also an offer in that scripture. And the offer is one of forgiveness. It says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? <clears throat> but conversely, how much reward do you think will accrue to those who do not do that? And that's kind of the theme of this wedding feast. Come and enjoy it, or ignore me and be punished. And then we think man is a sinner, man and woman both. I, I use man in the royal <laughs> sense there. We include everybody. Man is a sinner. And this is a trait that lies within all of us. During the good times, we tend to pay attention to the things that we want to do, the things that are pleasurable, and we pay less attention to the requirements that God puts on us as a result of our faith. Sometimes we ignore them until things turn bad. And that is a history of the Jewish people when you think about it, as we've traveled the trail with them. They turn to God when they're in trouble. God rescues them. Things are good. They turn away. Turn back to God when there's trouble the next time. And it goes on and on and on. And that's exactly what mankind has done throughout all of the known history. So when people didn't show up for this wedding feast, God, the king, says, go ahead and get everybody. Bring everybody in here. We're going to have a full wedding hall. This, of course, is an invitation to the Gentiles, as I said earlier. And it foreshadows the Jews' rejection of the gospel that's talked about in Acts chapter 13. And I would just tweak your memory a little bit. You'll recall that Paul and Barnabas were in Antioch. And they were teaching the gospel, bringing people to God. And the Jewish leadership in that area rejected them. They opposed them. They said, you're not teaching the law. You are breaking the law. Karen, would you read Acts 13, 44 through 48, Karen Ludicky? The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the words of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, Paul reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's what the king did. He sent people out on the roads and he stopped everybody who was going by and said, come on, I've got a feast, bring them in. Come in and eat with me and enjoy this feast that I prepared for you. 
And then that brings us to that point in that scripture where the king accosts one of these people who've come in off the road and is not wearing a wedding garment. Why do you think that's included in that scripture? I think that uh, when he was asked by the king, who was, we all know was really God Almighty, uh, about his situation, it was clear that this was not someone who had any interest in believing in God and recognizing heaven for what it was and all that, all that God was doing for him and others. And in other words, I think that the wedding garment was was symbolic of he was an unprepared, he was not a participator. He just happened in because it's going to be a free free road for him, and that's, that was it, or a free uh, meal or whatever type of symbolic thing. That's very good. He crashed the party. That's right. He crashed the party. Exactly. He crashed the party. Yeah, Jane. I was thinking when they talk about dress, I'm thinking about dressing in the full armor of God, and I thought of the breastplate and the, all the rest of it. I can't. I just thought if he wasn't dressed appropriately in faith, then he and you're getting to the crux of what I, of the point that I want to make in just a second. Jim, but he, nobody would have had the wedding garment with him. Thank you. And so because when he went out to grab people, he was grabbing people off the street at this point, right? So nobody walks down the street with their best tuxedo and all that in their arm. He was going out to those people and saying, you're all welcome. So he was equipping them with what, what he had. So it's just like when, you know, when the pastor calls and says, can I get you to do this for us? And you say, oh, I'm not ready for that. I'm not prepared for that. <laughs> when God calls you to it, he will equip you for it. And that's exactly what the king was doing. Is he, would bring, he would provide the cloak. But then there's that one rascal who says he's going to come in and he really doesn't have the right heart. And he says, I'm going to push back. I'm not going to take the cloak you offer me. I'm going to be myself here. And we see that in the church when we have 30% of evangelicals who don't believe in Jesus as the Son of God. He didn't want to wear his mask. <laughs> well, you know, Adam said that I ruined his sermon in two weeks. Well, he just ruined the point that I was going to make. <laughs> okay. Payback. I'm sorry. Payback. <laughs> because it's one thing that I didn't tell you about this wedding custom back in those days. And that is the fact that the host provided the wedding garments that the guest would wear. It was just another part of the expense that went into putting on this wedding feast. Typically, these were very simple, nondescript robes. They probably didn't cost a lot, but they cost something. and depending on how many people were coming to the wedding feast, then the host had to buy all of that robes and he provided them to them as people came to the banquet hall. They served a couple of purposes. Number one, it concealed a person's rank and social status. Everybody looked alike. And it encouraged people to mingle together and talk to each other because there was no social separation if you will. But symbolically in this parable those wedding garments identify the people who are righteous. The people who are believers. The people who follow Jesus Christ. And as I said the king's friendly at first. He says why are you not wearing the robe, the robe I gave you for this feast? That's not what he. That's not how the scripture writes it. But that's what he's asking this guy. I gave you a robe. How come you're not wearing it? And the guy has no answer. He doesn't respond. He doesn't say, "Well, I'm poor. I'm, I didn't get it." I, I, he just doesn't answer. And we can conclude from that that he wanted to participate in the feast. But he did not want to do what was required to do to honor 
the host. His heart wasn't there. His heart was not there. So he's thrown out. And then Jesus concludes this parable by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. Marianne, what do you think that means? Well, we're all called, but we don't all believe, so you're not chosen. Well, we're all called, but who does the choosing? God. And why would he not choose someone? Because he knows what's in your heart. Because he knows what's in your heart. You can stand up here and say as long as you want to, I love Jesus. But if it's not in your heart, it doesn't count. And that's why, when you get right down to it, why the Bible tells us that we are justified by faith and not by works. You can give to the poor. You can do whatever you want to do in terms of helping people who are less fortunate than you. But if it is not in your heart, those works do nothing for you. Many are called. But the few that are chosen are true believers. So let me ask you, what would you take from this parable here in October of the year 2020? 2,000 plus years after Jesus says these words to the religious leaders. What is your takeaway, if you will, from this parable? How about you, Cindy? I knew you were coming my way. I <laughs> saved you for last, baby. <laughs> um, just look around. I mean, look what we're going through. Uh, Jim, seriously, I don't... I. I Maybe I'm trying to make it too hard. Yeah. But let me come back to that question All in right. just a minute. Yeah, Floyd. Uh, uh, Jim, Revelation talks about being clothed in linen. Then I heard what was sounded like the voice of many people, and it was the sound of powerful rushing water, and it was like a loud thunder. And it says, "Thanks be to God, for the Lord our God is King. He is all powerful one." Let us be full of joy and be glad. Let us honor him. For the time has come for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And this bride has made herself ready. And she was given clean, white, fine linen clothes to wear. And fine linen is the right living of God's people. I started to put that scripture in this, in this uh, lesson, Floyd, but I figured we'd be running out of time, and so I didn't. But thank you for bringing it up, Jane. So when I think about this time... We have absolutely nothing to lose. We need to speak to people and challenge them to be sure that it's their, their hearts that are responding to who God is in this time of trouble. But, but Jim, this talks about the two natures of God. This talks about an angry God, but it also talks about a God of love. Yeah. And I, I can't help but as I look at that, and we talk about a wedding, we're talking about a joyous occasion. When someone comes to Christ, it is a joyous occasion. It's not something doom and gloom. And a lot of people outside the church say, oh, come and become a Christian. Oh. But I think most of us here today would say, say, without a doubt, we're glad we're children of God. We're no Amen. And as you keep reading in the book of Revelation, you'll come to a place where God's sitting on his throne and the sheep and the goats are coming and the sheep go to the right and the goats to the left and left is not good. That's right. And the That's sheep are emblematic of the followers of Jesus Christ. And they are used deliberately because sheep are led. They don't wander around by themselves like the goats do. Hmm. In 1975... <clears throat> there was a book, it was one of those self-help things that were so popular back in those days. And the name of the book is Dress for Success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And the author was writing this book <coughs> to help people get a job or get a promotion. And the thesis of the book is dress like you've already got the job. Yes. Dress like you've already been promoted. They called it power dressing. And it was a really popular book. I didn't read it because so I wore uniforms, so I didn't have to worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You're already dressing for success. You make robes and wear them. Going to the wedding. But when I was when I was putting all of this together, I was thinking, you know, <clears throat> when I took command of an infantry battalion at Fort Hood in 1975, the year that book came out. I had to get some new clothes, so Lynn and I went shopping, and we picked out this blue leisure suit. <laughs> Polyester. Polyester, with bell-bottom trousers, and an eggshell white silk shirt with big collar. <laughs> oh, Lynn has a picture. No, fortunately we didn't. All I needed was a mustache and a gold Cadillac, and I could have been a model for it. <laughs> The sex trader. Oh, the sex trader. <laughs> <laughs> then and now. Like and really, maybe even uh, high heels. <laughs> no, didn't have any high heels. <laughs> but I knew I was overdressed when I went to the first party that we had for all of those officers and their wives in that battalion. And one of the guys who I was going to fire eventually saddled up to me and said, boy, Colonel Taylor, you really look good tonight. That's a good looking suit. Oh. <laughs> and I think that's the last time I ever wore it. <laughs> and I thought about that. And, then, and I thought, you know, well, when my son got married, I rented six tuxedos for his groomsmen. So there is something to this dressing for success. But the point of this parable is not the wardrobe choices or the, it, that's just part of it. The point of this parable in today's environment, I believe, is that we must prepare for service. We must be intentional about what we are going to do and we need to have knowledge of the Word of God. Because without it, we can't prepare and we can't be intentional in our actions. And as you go back and look at this parable, what you find is that the first part of the parable is another indictment of the priest and the elders and how they've misled the people and mistreated the prophets. And they're warned that there will be no that there will be retribution. But this parable is also a warning to us today in 2020. It's a warning to the people. And to understand the warning, we have to remember that salvation comes in the form of a marriage. What is that marriage? Lloyd? Lloyd? to Christ? Yes. We're married to Christ. And Jesus is explaining in this parable what salvation means. Just as the king provided these wedding garments for his guests, God provides salvation for everyone who chooses to put it on. The wedding garment is the righteousness of Christ. And unless we have it, we're going to miss the wedding. John tells us in chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So is this parable telling us to wear our best clothes to church? No. No. But do you think you disrespect God if you come in your 
dirty work boots and mud stained overalls? No. 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 <coughs> I don't own them, so I don't know. <laughs> I think the transparency of an individual, as God can examine each of us as we walk in, has nothing to do with what we have on. It's what we have in our heart. You'd have to come with your faith. That's right. And your belief. That's exactly right. The I righteousness that you're talking about. Jim. We need to I'm sorry, you. Floyd? We'll have to come with the blood of Christ. Yes. And Jim, I, part of this, as you can see, <coughs> Jesus is a prophet. He talks about 30 years down the road. The king was angry and he sent his troops who, who would be uh, Rome and destroyed those murderers and burned their city in A.D. 7. Titus. Yep. So in this, in this parable, this wardrobe thing is just a symbolic part of the parable. It indicates on the part of this one person, a person who's been invited to the party, who's been given clothes to wear, but he chooses not to wear them, it's a lack of preparation. And it shows that he has no intention of honoring the king. And for us, the takeaway that we can learn here in this parable is that every one of us is going to come to the feast. Or we're going to come near to it sometime during our earthly lives. None of us is worthy of the feast because we're going to show up in garments that are stained by sin. And we're all going to be asked that question. How did you come here? Why did you come here? What is your purpose? And the answer to that question is provided when we put on Jesus Christ as the clothes that we wear. Questions or comments? Jane. I want to sing to you a song that helped me with that truth about I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I used to struggle with that. I'd say, okay, you are, but how do I put that on? And so here's a little song that a friend taught me years ago, and it answers that question every day. <clears throat> I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without the life, there is no growing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. Amen. Thank you, Jane. Anybody want to follow that? No. <laughs> then let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight and for our friends and family here. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to study your word. We thank you for Jane and Tom, and we ask that you would bless them as they leave us, that you would be with them, that you would remind them of us on those days when they move into this new place in Minnesota, that you would give them the comfort that they've had here, the love that they've had here, and we know that you will. And we thank you for our church and our pastor and his wife, for the leadership that they bring to us, and for the peace that comes with it. <clears throat> the peace that passeth understanding, as we're told in the Bible. And we ask that you would be with us as we leave here tonight. That you would bring us back as often as possible. Mm -hmm. That you would encourage us to continue to study your word and give us the wisdom that we need to understand it. 
And we ask all these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.